Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Money Matters. My name is Dan White. I am the host of your show this afternoon. Uh, I am president and CEO and founder of Dan White & Associates. We are a retirement planning firm. We have three offices. We are our main offices in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania. We have a satellite office in uh, Middletown, Delaware, and we just recently opened a third office down at the beaches in Lewis, Delaware. And we work primarily with uh, people that are either approaching retirement or are in retirement. We want to make sure they have enough income to last them the rest of their lives. And I am joined today on our program by my co-host, uh, Eric Parnell, CFA from Great Valley Advisors. How are you doing this afternoon, Eric? I'm doing well, Dan. It's great to see you again. Yeah. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so make sure you get out and, and get some chocolates or whatever you get for your uh, significant other there. So Absolutely. Get some flowers. Yeah. So it's uh, been kind of a crazy, uh, crazy first six weeks of the market, you know, it's uh, the rally kind of continued. And then uh, and then I guess, uh, you know, yesterday the inflation numbers came out and threw a bit of a bucket of water on the on the rally. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, what 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 is your view? What's the biggest market surprise to you so far in 2024? You know, I think the biggest thing has been the resilience. You know, we had that stretch of time uh, from October, the end of October through the end of December of 2023, and the market rally was phenomenal. I mean, it was a week, week period there during 2023 for a while and there in August, September and October. But then once the markets got moving to the upside, I mean, it was a tremendous run through the remainder of the year. And it wasn't just the stock market, but it was also the bond market. Um, so coming into 2024, one of the things that we could reasonably have expected was that, uh, you know, maybe the markets might take a bit of a breather, you know, particularly the technology sector, which has been, you know, so hot for so long. And we heard so much about the Magnificent Seven back in 2023, those those big technology stocks that drove the, the market higher. But really, the market has been determined to continue to grind to the upside. And I think that's really a testament to some of the things that we're going to talk about on the show today. I mean, the economy remains strong. The job market remains tight. Um, the housing market remains resilient, despite the fact that we've seen higher interest rates. Um, and there's all those expectations around whether the Federal Reserve is going to cut interest rates in 2024. And if so, by how much? Um, we got that hot inflation reading for January that might say, well, maybe the Fed's going to have to hold off on those rate hikes a little bit. Um, but the market, you know, it, it takes a lump and it keeps on moving to the upside. And that's, uh, you know, it seems to be the tone for the market so far here in 2024. Yeah, it seems like it's Teflon. Everything just kind of rolls off of it. And uh, <laughs> you brought up a, a good point. You talked about the Magnificent Seven, you know, and we know who these companies are NVIDIA and Apple, Microsoft and so forth. Um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. You know, I see a lot of parallels between the Magnificent Seven and kind of, you know, it's a long time ago, but we all remember the dot com bubble, you know, and uh, same thing back then. You had uh, you had AOL and Sun Microsystems and JDS Uniphase and all these companies that you thought were just going to be winners. They just went up every day. And uh, I see a lot of parallels between the two. Is that is that kind of your thought process as well? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. It's, you know, or, or go back, uh, I'll go back a few decades earlier, you know, there's the nifty 50 from the early 1970s. I mean, those stocks that, you know, the whole idea was is just go out and buy them and just hold on to them forever, regardless of the price. And just like we saw the dot com stocks in the late 1990s, the same principle seemed to be applying here today, where it's just, you know, valuation, what valuation if right. uh, go out and buy these stocks and hold them growth at any price. And, you know, it's one thing to see stocks rising this way in an environment when the Fed funds rate or interest rates are, are low, close to zero on the Fed funds rate. It's another thing altogether when we're in an environment where the you know interest rates are at five and a quarter, five and a half percent on the Fed funds rate, 10 year Treasury yield at four and a quarter percent. There are alternatives out there. Valuation yeah. starts to matter more. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how long these magnificent seven stocks can keep it going. But it's it's amazing the resilience so far. Yeah, and it surprises me because it does look so much like 2000, because when you put together the market caps of these seven companies, gosh, they make up 31 percent of the S&P 500 is just seven companies, you know, so. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like if you're if you're not in these seven companies, they're the ones that are driving the market. Uh, the overall market has been actually kind of flat and these seven companies are kind of leading the chase. 
And like you said, you touched on this a little bit about interest rates and, you know, the Fed, the Fed paused and everybody thought the pivot was coming, you know, and they're going to drop them. And a lot of people were really looking forward to March when, hey, they're going to cut rates. And of course, then we get 3.6 GDP in the fourth quarter and we get 300,000 jobs. And then we get an inflation factor that ticked up a little bit yesterday. Now they're saying, whoa, you know, <laughs> I don't think we're going to see rate cuts anytime soon. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, we came into 2024 and the thought was seven quarter point interest rate cuts in 2024, <laughs> which I, you know, I, I was definitely skeptical about as we came into 2024. Um, and, you know, as we continue through the year, well, kind of January came and went. And now, you know, are we going to get a rate cut in March? Um you know, one of the things that always stands out there is that, well, if the Federal Reserve is going to cut interest rates, they kind of need a reason to do that. You know, I understand the fact that, you know, the real Fed funds rate, which is the Fed funds rate minus the inflation rate, has it's at its highest level since before the financial crisis. But maybe the economy needs a high real interest, real Fed fund rate right now to keep it in check. I mean, we're seeing strong GDP numbers. We're seeing right. strong retail sales number. Housing market remains strong, lowest unemployment rate since the 1960s. Uh, you know, the, the inflation number that we got here for the month of January was hot. Maybe this is an economy that needs some higher interest rates to keep it in check. And one of the things that I increasingly wonder about as we go through 2024 is, you know, does the market go higher and need to go higher because it's going to get those interest rate cuts from the Fed? Or maybe we're back in an environment pre-financial crisis where the market will go higher because the economy can support the market going higher, because that's a better outcome, in my view, than being dependent on Fed rate cuts for the market to go higher. Yeah, the problem, I guess, the elephant in the room that nobody talks about is, yeah, you know, and I think you hit the nail on the head, Eric, is number one, they don't cut rates when things are good. Right. You know, everybody, everybody thinks rate cuts are, are, oh, the market's going to take off. They don't cut rates unless the economy is in trouble. And we're not seeing any signs that the economy is in trouble. But the elephant in the room is, are they going to start getting some political pressure to cut rates? Because when you have $34 trillion in debt at 5%, and that money's got to be rolled over. Some of that money's got to be rolled over this year. You know, I'm sure the federal government's saying, hey, we need, we need lower rates because our interest payments are way too high. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's I mean, it's one of the biggest and it's an increasingly bigger question as we go through 2024. You know, a great value advisor group. We serve financial advisors all across the country who, you know, they want to maintain their independence and, and serve their clients. But they're looking for things like, you know, back office support, compliance, technology, as well as asset management. So I spend a lot of time talking to advisors in our network. And one of the one of the biggest questions that comes up in terms of you know, the Fed and, you know, policy in 2024 is, well, what's going to happen with the presidential election? And is that something that we need to factor into our decision making process um, as the year goes on here? And, you know, what is that going to mean for the markets? And one of the things that we have historically seen, and I think it will continue to be true in 2024, is that the economy is huge and the markets are huge. And they are going to, you know, the economy is going to remain strong, whether a politician says so or not. Um, so regardless of the outcome of the election, whether it's the, the presidency, the, the Congress, the state and local elections, really the market will perform, the market performs well, regardless of who wins. The biggest thing that tends to happen is that after the elections, the market tends to rally regardless of who wins because an uncertainty has been removed. We have a history of markets performing well under Democratic and Republican controlled Congresses, Democratic and Republican controlled administrations. Um, but it's really more that an uncertainty gets removed and markets can do well regardless of who wins. So, yeah. you know, although that's a big uncertainty that a lot of people are contemplating in 2024, markets can perform well regardless of who wins the election. Yeah, I don't think the election has a whole lot to do with it. I think the Fed, it's actually the Fed that drives it more than the elections. I mean, and obviously, if we have split houses, then the, the Congress tends to get nothing done anyway, because, you know, they don't they don't agree on things. But we have a uh, question uh, from one of our viewers today. Um, Caden Washington from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, asks, what are the advantages of ETFs as an investment? Yeah, this is a great question because we're seeing more and more ETFs or exchange traded funds come out in the marketplace every year. And there's four key advantages associated with ETFs. The first has to do with liquidity. 
unlike a mutual fund where you sell it and you have to wait until after the market closes before it sells out, an exchange traded fund, it's trading on an exchange. So you can buy or sell it at any time during the trading day. The second aspect has to do with transparency. Unlike a mutual fund where there's all different types of holdings, but you might only find out th two or three times a year what's inside the mutual fund, you can go and pretty much check every single day to find out what's in your exchange traded fund. The third has to do with cost. A lot of the exchange traded funds that are out there tend to have expense ratios or internal costs that are a lot less than what mutual funds have, their equivalent mutual funds have. And the last has to do with tax efficiency. You know, for those of you that own mutual funds, it's not uncommon you get to the end of the calendar year and you get a big long term capital gain distribution or short term capital gain distribution. With exchange traded funds, those are built in. So those types of tax distributions don't happen and it helps reduce your tax bill uh, over time as well. So a lot of good advantages associated with these ETFs. Yeah, it's, that's definitely true. I know as an advisor, you know, when we're talking with clients, you know, you kind of you kind of warn them in December, hey, you don't want to make a big investment into this mutual fund. They're going to declare a capital gain in a week and you're going to get hit with a big tax bill and you've only been in the fund for like a week. So uh, the ETFs definitely address that as well. Well, we are uh, we are very fortunate today. We are ble uh, we have on our show with us Todd Reed from Keller Williams Real Estate to talk to us a little bit about the real estate uh, market and where it sits today. Uh, welcome to the show, Todd. Hey, thank you, Dan. Glad to be here. Hello, Eric. Hey, Todd. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. So I know, you know, uh, real estate and high interest rates don't necessarily go hand in hand. Uh, it kind of slows down the, uh, the, the, the transactions. But what's your what's your view of the local real estate market this year? Very similar to, to what we were just talking about. It's so resilient. We were so worried. Uh, we, we had interest rates around three, three and a half percent, it seemed like for a decade. And then we knew last year, year before, OK, rates are going to start going up. And we were really worried that it was going to just stymie the market and stop it in its tracks. And it's amazing that rates now are roughly in that seven percent range and it has not slowed the market down at all. It's still cooking. Uh, we're really driven more by a lack of inventory. So the rates haven't stopped the thing. Uh, I was last on the show about a year and a half ago and rates at that time were in the fives and we knew they were headed up more. And again, we didn't know what was going to happen. Here we are a year and a half later and I'm pretty much saying the same thing I said in that was June of 2022. Rates have not slowed the market down at all. It's very resilient. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned lack of inventory. I would think that would slow it down a little bit because, you know, from from our perspective, we know a lot of people, you know, we had zero interest rates for 15 years and uh, a lot of people did the refinancing and got in the mortgages at the at the two, three percent. And now even if they want to buy, uh, you know, they don't want to exchange their two and a half percent mortgage for a seven percent mortgage. So. I think inventory is probably uh, your biggest concern at this point. No doubt about it. Inventory is an issue. There are a lot of reasons that inventory is low and you just touched upon one of those. If you bought a home and you have a current mortgage at two and a half, three, three and a half percent, and you start running numbers and calculations to see what the next home is going to cost you at seven percent, you're just staying put. Uh, and that's that's a huge driver of the lack of inventory. So that's one of many factors. Uh, you know, there are several, but I'd say that's number one. You know, Todd, one of the things I always wonder about is that, you know, this you have this tight inventory. Housing market remains strong. Prices continue to go up. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of new construction going on. So what loosens uh, what loosens that up and causes home builders to say, hey, you know what? It's time for us to start putting some more houses up and uh, provide some of this inventory. Well, lack of new construction is definitely a problem also. Uh, and again, re real estate is very regional, but this isn't just a, a problem in my region. That's This is a countrywide problem. There is a lack of new construction homes. There's nowhere near enough new homes being built for the demand. Uh, there's a, there are a lot of reasons for that. A uh, cost of ground, cost of improvements, cost of construction. 
uh, lack of contractors. Uh, there's a big shortage of electricians and plumbers and roofers and framers, uh, everything, every, everyone involved with construction of a new house. There just seems to be a shortage in that entire industry. Uh, it just seems like people people have left that industry and you know a few years ago probably during that great recession when everything slowed down in 08 09 and 10 they left the new construction industry and they never seemed to have come back so even if a builder owns a piece of ground and hey they're willing and ready to build a bunch of homes they have trouble finding contractors they have trouble finding guys the guys or girls to do the job they just they have a lack of help mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's a, a total seller's market. I mean, what what if you're thinking about selling a home, what should you be thinking about in terms of optimizing the price that you get? And what are some of the considerations you have should have in mind in this type of market? Eric, it is a total seller's market. So every seller has walked away from every transaction, probably in the last two years, very happy. Uh, what is happening for sellers when they put a home on the market with this lack of inventory? They have many buyers rush out almost immediately to look at the property. Assuming it's a nice property and people like that property, they are getting multiple offers again within two, three, four days. So they, they get a bunch of showings and all of a sudden the seller may have somewhere between two and 10 offers to look at and consider. So if you're that seller, you're living good. Uh, people are bidding over your asking price. Uh, buyers are doing things that just, they normally may not do uh, to make their offer more attractive to the seller. Uh, they're waiving inspections. Uh, a lot of buyers typically were doing a home inspection at the property at a well and a septic system. They would do a well inspection, a septic system inspection, the termite inspection, maybe a radon inspection today to make their offer look more attractive to the seller and to stand out above the other offers. A lot of buyers are waiving all the inspections and that might not be great for buyers, but the sellers love it. So the, the sellers are running the show, e even things like closing date. Uh, maybe the buyer would like to be in a home 30 or, you know, within 30 or 45 days, but the sellers are controlling those terms and the sellers are saying, we're not sure maybe where we're going or we are building a new home and we need 90, 120 days before we can vacate. And the buyers might not love that. Uh, but they're saying, OK, you know, we'll give you that 90 or 120 days before closing. Uh, again, if they don't do it, one of their other buyers that they're in competition with will. So the, the, the sellers are really getting all the optimal terms that that they could possibly want in this market. Yeah, it's kind of crazy when you say it's a seller's market. I mean, I, I don't think it's as crazy as it was like a year or two ago where you'd put your house up for sale and you'd have like 20 bids on it and you know everybody's out bidding each other. And I mean, it's just like a, like eBay, you know, like <laughs> going, going, you know? Um, and I, and I think home prices, you know, I, I think I read somewhere where the average home price went from like 350 to over 500. So, I mean, it's really driving up the prices as well. Of simple, simple economic supply and demand. I mean, there's plenty of demand and not enough supply. Uh, part of that reason for demand are rental prices. So, uh, again, in my area, uh, it has become common now. It's hard to find a, a rental and apartment under two thousand dollars a month, and three and four thousand a month has now become common. So, a whole bunch of those people paying two, three, four thousand a month rent, they don't want to keep paying rent. Those folks want to buy a property. They want to build equity with appreciation. Uh, they want to enjoy their own home. You know, you want to paint it purple, paint it purple. Uh, you know, do what you want in your yard. You know, they don't want to be in apartments. So they want to move, uh, but they they just can't. Uh, There's just not enough to look at. But I'll tell you, and you mentioned that market hasn't changed or has changed, isn't as bad as it was, I should say, in the last year or two it's still leaning that direction. Uh, I still see properties that get double digit offers. It's, it's still happening. It hasn't yeah. changed much. So from a buyer's standpoint, I mean, you know, my kids are, are of home buying age and they're friends. And so you got, you know, a young couple maybe just got married. They're saving up. They might have 30, 40, 
you know, $1,000 and they're looking for that starter home and they're hard to find because the average prices are through the roof right now. What, what kind of suggestion would you give a buyer today? Because like you say, I've had, I've had these kids tell me, I, we, 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 we bid on 20 homes and we get outbid every time, you know? So what's your advice to a buyer? And it, it is so tough on that buyer you just described. My son also fits in that, yeah. in that bracket and uh, it's just almost impossible. Uh, and yeah, I, I used to personally, I still do. I love that couple that you just described. They may have saved thirty, forty thousand dollars uh, $40,000. They're a couple or a few years out of college. And I used to be able to find those people a home and maybe they put down a three and a half percent on some loans, a 5%, they would put the minimum down and there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, they'd be able to buy that property. The problem with getting 10 offers on a property, the seller not only is going to look at price, they're also going to look at terms and qualifications. If you're that buyer and you're in competition against another buyer that has all cash, maybe they either have cash in the bank or they're going to liquidate liquidate a 401k or other retirement funds, that buyer with a minimum down payment is, is in trouble. Uh, they're up against it. They, they really have trouble competing. They obviously need to get pre-qualified right away, talk to their mortgage representative and have a solid pre-approval letter from a legitimate mortgage person that says, hey, my people are as good as cash because I can almost guarantee that we can get these folks a mortgage. So the full pre-approval is very important. Uh, and you see a lot of creativity uh, from buyers and offers from buyers. Uh, other things they can do. Uh, for example, most homes in my area uh, come with a 2% transfer tax. So that's typically an even split between the buyer and the seller. The buyer pays 1% of the sale price. The seller pays 1%. A lot of these buyers, maybe the, maybe their offer says, hey, we'll pay both percent of the transfer tax. Uh, back to waiving and being willing to waive inspections. I'm not necessarily advising that. I, I don't love that, but that's what it takes to be a competitive buyer in this market. You need to be willing to do things that maybe are out of your comfort zone. But if you want to buy today, you need to do that. Uh, the other thing may be uh, maybe expanding your search area, you know, instead of saying, oh, I want to be within 15 minutes of, of work, you know, maybe you go 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Uh, so expand your criteria can also help. Yeah, that was one of the things that I was wondering about too, Todd. Is that you know the the real estate market tight around here with you know, supply and demand imbalance? Are there any markets around the country that you say uh, you know it's a little bit of a better environment for a buyer to go and consider right now? There are. Uh, so yes, uh, examples. Uh, I have a buyer that just moved here from Oregon, and I looked at their home that they currently have for sale. In, it's been up about 60 days. I believe it's Eugene, Oregon. Uh, and that home has been up for sale for 60 days. It looks like a very nice home. There's nothing glaring wrong with it. Uh, it's in a price point that would be a popular, popular price point, but that home is not selling. And again, that's not my market. All I can do is, the only thing I can do is ask them why. And they're telling me that all of a sudden, there is a bunch of inventory in their area that has come on the market. And maybe some of the little bit higher prices, uh, those homes weren't selling. So they've dropped their price more into my client's price range. And now my client to be competitive has just dropped their price. Um, another agent friend of mine uh, who's licensed in a few different states. Uh, I know that uh, she does some business in Ocean City, Maryland. Hmm. Of course, the vacation market's different than my typical market, but uh, all of a sudden in that area, there's there's a good bit of inventory and, and that's slowed down. I know last year in that Ocean City market, anything that went on the market, just like it did here, it sold within a week. Uh, that market has now slowed down and there's inventory there. So, yes, I'm hearing rumors and I'm hearing some from some other places in the country that there there is now more inventory and things have slowed down. I got to tell you, though, I'm, I'm in a suburb just west of Philadelphia that has not hit my area yet because we are still, I would call it a total seller's market. So from a uh, from a realtor standpoint, uh, I know how you used to go out and try to help buyers. 
I guess now it's all about getting the listings, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> entirely, Dan. And there, there's always, there have always been agents that specialize in maybe one or the other. I, I've always been a 50 50 guy. So, uh, in my 40 years, I'm generally half buyers and half sellers. And you are correct. My half buyer side now is very difficult. Uh, the transactions I've done in the last two years, uh, I'm probably 80% sellers. So it's easy for someone maybe that doesn't know my business that well. And friends of mine even say, well, why don't you just go get a bunch of sellers, you know, put a bunch of, get a bunch of listings, put a bunch of homes on the market. <laughs> well, the, there aren't a bunch of sellers to be found. And that sounds easy, but they're not out there. That's the whole reason that we're in the mess that we're in. Uh, there just aren't a lot of sellers to be had. So you have a huge pool of real estate agents now fighting over a small pool of sellers and yes we want we all want those sellers but it's, it's they're not easy to find trust me you know todd the advice the financial advisors the registered investment advisors in our network um you know they have clients and they're maybe they've relocated or they're in a current market and and they want to buy a house um but they're they're holding off right now saying okay i'm gonna i'm gonna wait for the get some relief in this market have some prices come down what what is your outlook for the next six to 12 months in terms of uh, the housing market, both in, in this area and nationwide? There, my favorite crystal ball question, uh, <laughs> be, because I, I have people and I'm saying, you know, I have said maybe go ahead and sign your lease for another year and wait this out. But what you're asking there is like trying to predict that, like you talked about earlier, trying to predict a future stock market. They're just events and things that happen in the future that are unforeseen today that we don't know what's coming in the future. It's we but we all pretty much agree that we're going to trend down on interest rates. So that's a great thing. When will this inventory change, though, that I can't answer that uh, we have a an aging you know, community where you would think a lot of folks maybe going into retirement communities should put their homes on the market. Uh, we're not even seeing a lot of that. So uh, there's a chain involved. So the person that is in a lower dollar home who wants to move up to a higher dollar home, they won't put their home on the market because there's nothing for them for, to look at. And I'm trying to tell them, well, you need to sell your home. And they're like, OK, we can sell our home in three days, but we have nowhere to go. So the chain is broken from the beginning. Uh, everyone that would typically be a move up buyer, a lot of these people are staying put. I don't know where we're headed. I, I know one thing from 40 years though, the market is always changing and it will change again. And this market can't last forever. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, who would have thought that higher interest rates uh, would drive the price of real estate up? That seems to be an anomaly, but that's kind of what has happened with the supply and demand. So it's been kind of bizarre, but uh, I guess you're looking for rate cuts. I guess that's that's kind of the next thing, right? Sure. And, and there's uh, one thing buyers can do to maybe say, I'm going to wait this out. Go ahead and buy a home today with the idea of in a year or two, uh, hopefully things do come down and you can refinance. So if you're at 7% today and in two years we get back to five, five and a half, do a refinance. Uh, that That's a great idea. Well, that's great information, uh, Todd. And we, we appreciate having you on the show. And that wraps up another edition. Uh, Thank you of Money Matters. So I want to thank Eric for co-hosting. I want to thank Todd for being a guest. And uh, we'll see you again on another, another edition of Money Matters. Thank you, Dan. And next week's guest, uh, we're going to have Deborah Morad from Corex Therapeutics. So make sure you tune in next week. Uh, we're going to have another great show of Money Matters. And until then, we'll see you next week.